Welcome to episode 4 of season 8 of the Gospel Arguments Podcast. Today I'm going to talk about what happens when you don't rightly divide the scriptures. You can come up with all kind of false teachings and that's what we're going to look at. Just a few of them today. Let's get after it. Thank you for joining us for the Gospel of Goodness Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Storm and Norman, here to tell you everything I know and some things I highly suspect. Today we're going to discuss just a few of the false teachings that you can get into when you don't rightly divide the Bible. You can make the Bible say whatever you want it to if you don't rightly divide it. I'll just go ahead and be honest with you. It's been a busy weekend I'm tired yesterday, it's Tuesday today, I usually record on Monday, but yesterday was my wife's birthday, so I didn't get a chance to finish my notes Sunday, I worked on them a little yesterday, worked on them a little today, they're not great, I'm not in love with them, I wish I could have done a better job, but life is just crazy sometimes, maybe someday we'll come back and revisit this topic, I've been talking about this episode for months now and I'm finally getting around to it and I wish I had something better for you but maybe you'll like it I don't know you know most of the time when I teach Sunday school the lessons that I think are terrible are the ones people like the most so who knows maybe you'll like this one I didn't even have time to do my opening segment notes here so we'll just have to roll with whatever comes off the top of my head I'm trying to get this done before my wife gets home so I can edit it and all that stuff. Uh, it's raining outside, so there's your weather report. Hot during the day, raining after. Actually, it ain't been raining too much in the last week, so. But it's making up for it today. Making up for it today. Then COVID cough still lingering, but we got a joyful noise segment for you today. Don't you worry none. We got it covered. Bibles I've been using this week. Turquoise again. Took it to church to teach Sunday school with. And the more you use this thing, the more you can't put it down. Because it just gets so buttery smooth. And love that thing. Still haven't brought myself to write in it yet. But I might. Someday. If you got a topic for me you like me to discuss, somebody mentioned one last week. Or a couple of them, actually. Last week, I need to write down in my handy little book here. But if you got one, listener topic you'd like me to cover, throw it down there in the comments. And we'll try and get to it uh, eventually, this season or next season. At some point, we'll get to it. Anyway, that's all I got for... Uh, Oh, I guess I'll update you on the uh, store. I know some of y'all, you probably don't care nothing about that store, but the reason I talk about it so much is because I'm thinking about expanding it, making it a business, kind of. You know, an extension of the mini I don't know what you would call it. Anyway, I found out I can't sell directly off that site. I have to use other sites if I want to sell it so I'm trying to figure out how that works or if I even want to do it because I'm not sure but uh the thing is I don't know y'all I'm not wearing one today but y'all probably seen me wear them shirts they got King James scripture right on them and I used to get those from King James clothing company or KJV clothing company uh, but I think they went out of business and there's not many places you can go to to get t-shirts that have you know king james verses on them or you know whatever he sold other t-shirts and stuff too that you know had like a logo that said kjv or like this back here i got from him king james bible believer yeah i got the shirt and the hoodie for that got the shirt the hoodie and the poster uh but i guess he went out of business i know he was my friend on facebook 
uh, we didn't we weren't didn't really know each other but he was my friend on facebook and i know, think he had some health problems or something i don't know but he the website closed down at least last time i tried to get on it last year it wasn't available so i was thinking maybe i'll i'll launch this store to sell merch for the podcast and then eventually i'll grow it into something like what he had going where you can get shirts with king james scriptures on them and uh another idea i have is preacher's quotes like i always use at the end of the show get preacher's quotes on there anyway that's just an idea that's the only reason i talk about the store some of y'all probably could care less but uh that's the only reason i talk about it is because i see it as an opportunity to spread the word on a t-shirt because i like wearing shirts like that uh anyway that's all i got for you let's get into the main topic when you don't rightly divide why are there so many opposing viewpoints when it comes to bible doctrine how can you know who's right I've met people on Facebook, well, I used to be an independent, I remember back when I used to be a Baptist, and before that I was a Pentecostal, and now I'm a charismatic. Ain't no way to be. That tells me that's someone who don't study the Bible for themselves. Uh, But, who's right? How do you know? Are the Presbyterians right? Are the Methodists right? Baptists right? Today we're going to look at a couple of uh, these things, these uh, wrong doctrines and uh see how they got that way how'd they get so far off and there's others i could have included that i didn't i got two and a half pages here Uh, i didn't want to go too far but there's others i could have talked about but mostly these are charismatic stuff i don't know the baptism things probably taught you know in a bunch of other churches uh but it's mostly charismatic stuff we all know by now, 2 Timothy 2.15, we've said that verse on here several, many hundreds of times. And uh, we know that it tells us to study our Bibles, study to show yourself approved. And uh, it tells us to rightly divide our Bibles. So it tells you to study it, and it tells you how to study it. And, you know, unless you got a new version or something in like we already talked about (laughs) it tells you something completely different but what happens when you don't rightly divide you start applying doctrine from other dispensations into the one we are currently in we are currently in the church age dispensation and you know i know some of y'all listen don't uh, you you don't agree with dispensationalism or whatnot uh but you really uh, i don't want i don't i don't want to insult nobody it's just you gotta you gotta do some crazy things to explain the Bible when you don't rightly divide it. I said before one of Dr. Rutman's quotes on here where I'm paraphrasing this, of course, all false doctrine is just doctrine or all false doctrine is just right doctrine applied to the wrong dispensation. I mentioned before how the Bible contains three people groups. Three people groups. The Jews, the Gentiles, and the church. It contains things that are written to each people group as well. You know, uh, things that cover all of them too. There's stuff in there that's written to the Jews. Stuff in there written to the Gentiles. Stuff in there written to the church. And there's stuff in there that is written to all three. All three groups. That is where right division comes in. Uh, It's common sense that if you're reading instruction, say you're at work, uh, you're at your job or whatever, and your boss gives... Some instructions, maybe he pins them up on the board or writes them on the chalkboard, whatever. Uh, And it's for a different department than what you work in. You wouldn't go read those and be like, oh, this is what I got to do. No, it's for another department. It's not for you. You know, if you were an electrician, you wouldn't go read the instructions that were given to the plumber and be like, oh, this is what we got to do today. No, they're not for you. They're for the plumber, not for the electrician. Same situation here. If you take instructions given to the Jews 
and try to apply it to the church or to the church, try to apply it to the Jews or Gentiles or whatever, uh, you're going to get all messed up. You'll get off in the weeds somewhere. So let's talk about some of these weeds. We'll begin with some charismatic things, although this first one I think uh, there's several churches or denominations or whatever you want to call them uh, that teach this thing right here. Mostly where they mess up is that they don't recognize Acts as a transitional book. Acts is a transitional book. And it, there's three transitional books in the New Testament. Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews. And it's really going to be a hard time if you try to get doctrine from a transitional book. Because nothing, things are changing from one end of the book to the other or whatever. Things are changing. And we see that especially in the book of Acts, the dispensation was transitioning after Jesus ascending from the definition or the dispensation of the law transitioning into the dispensation of the church age. So it's really a bad idea to try and get church doctrine from Acts. Uh, Charismatics generally teach that baptism is a necessary part of salvation, although there's probably others that teach the same thing too. We go to Acts 2.37. Which is where they pretty much get this from. 37.38. Now when they had heard this. They were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles. Men and brethren. What shall we do? So they heard Peter. Preach this message. And it convicted them in their heart. And they asked. What shall we do? That we have done this. We've killed Jesus. We've crucified the Messiah. What should we do? In verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Notice there it said remission of sins. Remission and redemption, not the same thing. Not the same thing. But anyway, They take this passage and apply it to the church, even though it has nothing to do with the church. Peter is a Jew preaching a Jewish message to a bunch of Jews. There's no church here. There's no Christians present here. No Christians have been even in existence yet. They're not asking what they must do to be saved. That's not what he asked. He said, what shall we do? Didn't say nothing about salvation. Peter didn't preach nothing about salvation. They're not asking nothing about salvation. Just look a little further at verses 39 and 40 where it says, For the promise is unto you and your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Then look at verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Do we save ourselves when we get saved? No. Well, we don't. So it's clearly they're not talking about salvation there. Peter's saying, this is what you got to do to get the remission of sins for crucifying your Messiah. This is how you separate yourself. Because remember, the Jews said, let his blood be upon us and our children whenever they asked for Jesus to be crucified. And Peter's trying to teach them, this, this is what you're going to have to do to separate yourselves from that untoward generation. Many charismatics try to say that you know this section here in Acts 2 is church doctrine and it, it just don't work. It just don't work. And uh, as you read through the book of Acts, it's kind of obvious the transition that's happening. Nothing but Jews in this chapter, in this chapter, in this chapter. And then you get on up uh, closer toward the middle and all of a sudden, oh, Gentiles are getting saved now. Gentiles are getting saved. And then Acts 15, they get together and they be like, well, hey man, Gentiles are getting saved, so that means something ain't right here. Uh, we're doing something wrong because they were like, saved Jews still need to obey the law. And then the Gentiles got, oh, I'm, I'm chasing a rabbit here, but you read, you read Genesis or Acts 15, and that's really an important chapter uh, 
far as dispensationalism goes, you see the change taking place. They start to figure out, hey, things ain't like they used to be. Things are different. Anyway, another thing let's talk about. Speaking in tongues and healing. Another teaching among charismatics is, I'm not trying to pick on charismatics today. It's just it was too easy uh, to, to get these. But another teaching among charismatics is the gifts of speaking in tongues and faith healing, laying on of hands and whatnot. We'll get to the healing part in a minute. Now, tongues varies in the way it is taught. Some teach speaking in tongues is necessary for salvation. Some teach it's a prayer language and whatnot. The Bible was clear that these were gifts given to the apostles that were meant to be temporary. Let's go to Acts 2, 4 through 8. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there was dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And, th and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? This was clearly not some unknown language that nobody had ever heard before. Ramalama, Shamalama, Yabba Dabba Doo. It was none of that gibbery nonsense. It was actual languages because people understood. The people from different nations understood. Again, the point was so that a bunch of Jews from different countries could understand the message that they were giving them. Keep in mind, there's no Christian church until later in the book of Acts, like I've already said. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 46. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter. The key here to this right here uh, is, you know, verse 45, you know, the... Uh, Pentecostals or Charismatics or whatever they want me to see. They're speaking in tongues. The Gentiles are speaking in tongues. But look at verse 45. And they of the circumcision which believed, so they've already believed, were astonished because of these Gentiles was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, what was the point of the Gentiles being able to speak in tongues, it was for these uncircumcised believers. And we'll get to that. Let's cross-reference to Matthew twelve thirty-eight. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. So they're asking Jesus for a sign. Matthew 16, 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he should show them a sign from heaven. They're asking for a sign. The Jews are asking for a sign. And that goes back to 1 Corinthians one twenty two. Paul writes, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So why were these things done? Because the Jews require a sign. These Gentiles, they got the Holy Spirit, and... The gift of speaking in tongues was poured out. Why? Because otherwise, uh, Jewish unbelievers are never going to believe it. That they got saved, that they or whatever it was they got. <clears throat> They're never going to believe that they believed. That these Gentiles believed and God accepted them. That's why God put the tongues, they gave, gave them the gift of talking in tongues there. Because the Jews require a sign. It was for the Jews, not for the Gentiles. Acts five twelve through 16 And by the hands of the apostles were many signs of wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men 
and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities, round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. So all these acts were done by the apostles. These healing, and we're talking about healing now. But these were done by the apostles. They weren't done by regular old people. That's why they're called apostolic gifts. And we see the requirements to be an apostle in Acts one twenty two. It says, Beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So those are the requirements. You had to be there when Jesus was baptized of John until that same day he was taken up, which you read earlier in chapter number one. So is there anybody here in 2021 who was alive to see that happen? No, there's not. So there's no more apostles because... All the people that call themselves apostles these days, they simply don't meet the requirements listed here. Let's go one more, uh, one more reference, 2 Timothy. Desk is a mess again. 2 Timothy 4.20. It's my hand size turquoise, if anybody was wondering. Erasmus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus I have left at Miletum sick. Paul's talking about his companions and he's saying hey I left Trophimus back there sick so obviously the gifts of healing these apostolic gifts that were given to the apostles here uh, because the Jews require a sign uh, are fading away they're fading away they've served their purpose you know they did uh, you read through the book of Acts you get to the end I've read this before. Let me see if I can find it and read it again. Uh, you get to the end of the book of Acts. Uh, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and they will hear it. Start off the book of Acts where they're preaching to Jews, getting Jews saved. The Jews keep rejecting. The Jews keep rejecting. And then you get to the end and God's like, if you ain't going to take it, I'll, I'll take it to the Gentiles. And you see that. Uh, Jews, 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 you get to the halfway point in the book of Acts when, you know, chapter 9 when Paul's saved, and then chapter 15 where they have the council in Jerusalem. And then after that, you see a strong focus on getting Gentiles into the church instead of Jews. Not that they ain't still trying to get Jews, but they've shifted their focus away because the Jews keep rejecting the gospel, so they shift their focus toward the Gentiles and that's what the church is mostly made up of now is Gentiles because the Jews keep rejecting so here we see the apostolic gifts obviously they're fading away because Paul says hey I left Trophimus and Miletum sick he's an apostle he has the gift of healing why didn't he heal Trophimus it must be it must be on its way out the door. Because Paul's at the end of his life here. And once the apostles go, the, the gifts went. And we see that here. If he's got the ability to heal, why would he not heal Trophimus, his buddy? He wouldn't have left him there sick. So there you go. There's a few things. Oh, I wanted to read one more thing. Let's read 1 Corinthians 13, 8-10. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So, Paul's saying, at some point, all this stuff, speaking in tongues, prophesying, that's going to stop. Now, the charismatic will tell you that it says there, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. They'll say that perfect is when Jesus comes back, the second coming. 
I want to tell you that this is what is perfect. The perfect word of God. At this time, they didn't have what we have here. They didn't have a New Testament. All they had was an Old Testament. Whenever they went out evangelizing, preaching and whatnot, they had to preach out of the Old Testament. Because the New Testament hadn't been put together yet. That's what they're talking about. Uh, the sign gifts were a witness to the power of God on the church. It was a, you know, testimony. To what God was doing in the church. It was necessary at the time. It's not necessary anymore. Why? Because we got this. We got the whole counsel of God. We got the whole word of God here. We don't need tongues. And prophesying. And you know. Smack people in the head and they fall down. You're healed brother. We don't need that. We have this now. Okay. So those are a few things. When you don't rightly divide, uh, some bad doctrine you can get into. The baptism thing was, you know, something from another dispensation trying to be applied to this one. Same with the the gifts. It was for the apostles in that time, not this time. I know some people are going to disagree, and that's fine. But boy, I tell you what, and I know. Some people who will agree with me, Brother Scott will, I know for sure. When you rightly divide, my goodness, my goodness, man. This thing just comes alive when you rightly divide it. You start going, oh, you know, if you don't rightly divide it, when you get to something that doesn't make sense, like you're reading in the New Testament and it says this, and you're like, wait a minute, that don't sound right. Then you have to, oh, well, see some, you know, somebody who thinks they're smart will come along, will come along and spiritualize that verse. Say what it really means is that this is like this and you're like this and don't mess it all up. But when you rightly divide, you can come to something and be like, you can take it for what it says, but apply it where it goes. If you apply it where it goes, you can take it where it says what it says. If you don't apply it to where it goes, then you got to be like, oh, what am I going to do here? You have to chop it and cut it and make a round, you know, make a square peg fit in a round hole. You don't have to do that if you rightly divide it. Anyway, that's all I got for you today. For all the information you need regarding the podcast, including social media, how to support us financially, how to be saved, and information on me, your host. Check out the website, gospelurgimmicks.org. One of the uh, uh, stores, one of the ways I can get my store out, it says that uh, they got, you know, all these different things they interact with. And Wix is one of them. And my website is through Wix. So that's the thing I'm going to look into seeing how, if I can get the store onto my already existing Wix side, or do I got to start another one? I don't know. But anyway, that's what we're looking at, trying to do. If not, then I guess I'll just go back to Teespring. If you like what you saw today, subscribe, like, share, rate, review, follow. Before I go, let me ask, are you saved? In order to be saved, you must put your faith in the gospel of the grace of God. Don't know what that is? I'm going to tell you. But this is what you got to understand about rightly dividing. There's different gospels. In the Bible. Did you know that? I know some people will be like, Oh, that's heresy. But there is. Maybe we'll do an episode on that. I probably should have already done an episode on that. But there's more than one gospel. In the Bible. <laughs> but uh, the one that, for our dispensation, is the gospel of the grace of God. Uh, what, co- what Paul called his gospel that Jesus gave him. And we're going to read it to you. First Corinthians 15, 1-4. Moreover, brethren... I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, Paul's gospel he received from Christ, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. 
That's all there is to it. You don't got to get baptized. You ain't got to speak in tongues. You ain't got to live a perfect sinless life. That was another one I was going to touch on. Uh, but I kind of ran out of time. And uh, I just needed to get this done. Maybe we'll come back and... I know we've already done episodes on all this stuff I'm talking about. So if you want to go back, you can see them. Uh, but that's all you got to do. You ain't got to talk in tongues. You ain't got to get baptized. You ain't got to be sinless. All you got to do is believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I saw somebody in a group the other day. You think that... Well, then you must think that a Christian can get saved and go and live however they want. That's exactly what I think. Will they? No. Because if you truly get saved, Jesus will save you. But like I said before, if you get saved and you spend 10 years on the mission field preaching and getting people saved, then you come home and start drinking and going to the saloon and not going to church, you're still saved. You're not unsaved. Once saved, always saved. All you got to do is believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and you will be saved and he will change you. Set you on a new path. All right? Let me get out of here. Till next time. Take your cross. Carry on. All right, let's do the joyful noise segment. <clears throat> this is going to be one I've done it. I think I've done it a few times on here, but I, don't, I think it's been a while since I did it, and uh, so thought we'd give it a shot again. You know, it's called Sweet Beulah Land. I'm kind of homesick for a country. To where I've never been before No sad goodbyes Will there be spoken For time won't matter Someday on the I'll stand there my home shall be eternal Beulah land, sweet Beulah.